Good day and welcome to Living Word, Scripture and Tradition brought to you by your Catholic friends and neighbors of the Diocese of Biloxi. I'm Father Joe Delatuso, your host. Happy Easter to you. I'm sure that all of us are enjoying the end of Lent and the beginning of the new life that has come to us through the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. I thought for the Easter show it would be interesting for me to, as it were, walk you through some of those last days of Jesus' life. Not walk you through reading the scripture, but walk you through with slides and explanation that I took myself when I was in the Holy Land. Before I start showing you any of the slides though, I want to just step over to the board here and explain something to you important for your understanding of those last days in regard to the topography or the geography of Jerusalem. Let me just come over here and what I'd like you to remember as I've said many times in our sessions together that Jerusalem is up in the mountains. It's 2,500 feet above sea level. And the city of Jerusalem itself is set on two hills. Therefore, the topography is a very rolling kind of hill. First of all, if we were looking at it from the south, what we would see is a hill over here, which comes down into a valley, up to another hill, down to another valley, and then up again like so. The city of Jerusalem is built on these two hills, like so, the walls of the city, which means what? Well, which means that there's a valley, not quite as steep as I first drew it, right through here in the middle of the city itself. Of course, a wall comes around the bottom side of that. But if a person is walking through the city of Jerusalem, he or she is either going uphill or downhill if they're going from east to west, or they're walking down in a trough or up on one of the hillsides when they're going north and south. Why that's important is the first slide that I'll show you in a moment We'll be standing over on the side of this hill over here. It's called Mount Zion. It's noted for a very famous garden, which is right on one of its sides right here. That is called the Garden of Gethsemane. Very obviously you know where that comes from. This particular valley, which comes this way and joins this valley over here, and then also joins another valley coming from that way, these three valleys have names. This valley over here is called the Kedron Valley. You remember in the Gospels it talks about Jesus going out to the Kedron Valley to the Garden of Gethsemane. The valley that runs right through the middle of the city is called the Tyropean Valley and the valley on the outside of the far wall on the, on the western side of the city is called the Hinnon Valley. Now, those are just in here for your reference point. This, of course, is the valley we're going to be concentrating on as well as this particular uh, hillside over here. Let's reconstitute then what happens in those last days of Jesus. He comes down from Galilee in the north. He's going to Jerusalem. He comes up from Jericho, up that long road of some 12 miles, which leads from below sea level up to the heights of Jerusalem, 2,500 feet above sea level. He gets to that point, and of course, right outside of Jerusalem, right over this, the Mount Zion, is the little town of Bethany. Now, you might remember Bethany as being the home city of some very good friends of Jesus, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. So perhaps Jesus, after he comes up from Jericho, spends a few days here. Finally, he tells his disciple, it's time to go into the city. Now, remember, in the Gospels particularly, Jerusalem is always portrayed as kind of the the den of the enemy, not because of the people, but because of the leadership of the people. Both the Roman leadership and the Jewish leadership are in the city of Jerusalem. The temple is in here. So there's at once for Jesus this magnetism. He wants to go to the city because this is where the Messiah is supposed to go, to the leadership, the headquarters of the nation. But at the same time, same time you can feel him being tugged the other way. If I go there, he chances are he knows what's going to happen to himself. He's certainly not the first person who has run up against the law, both the Roman authorities and the Jewish authorities, and he knows what happens to those who run up against the leadership, the authority of the country. They usually end up dead. So Jesus then, last Sunday, Palm Sunday, comes to the brow of this hill. He sends some of his disciples ahead to get a donkey because he's going to come down this hill through some gates, which are right here in the wall, called the Golden Gate. 
Now we call that today, if you look in scripture, you won't see any reference to a gate in the walls of Jerusalem called the Golden Gate. You will see reference, however, to a gate called the Gate of the Beautiful or the Beautiful Gate. And here the scripture scholars think is the gate that Jesus really went through. The reason for the change of name is this. In Greek, the name beautiful is Oriah. Oriah. And in Latin, the word for gold is Aurea. They think that when the translation was made from somewhere along the line, from Greek into Latin, the word beautiful, Oriah, becomes Aurea golden. And so the gate we know today as the Golden Gate would have been known in Jesus' time as the Beautiful Gate. And you will see that gate referred to in the scripture itself. Let's take a look then at that first picture, that first slide here, is the scene that Jesus would have seen as he come up over Mount Zion. He looks down on Jerusalem below him. He's looking at the wall there right in the foreground. And in, you can see the gold dome, that's the, of course, the Muslim temple that's there today. That wouldn't have been what Jesus saw when he looked down there from this site. What he would have seen would have been this next slide. He would have been looking down at the temple. Now, as amazing as this particular slide is, I want you to know that the temple here is only three foot tall. It's a model that is in, this, in the city of Jerusalem today. Jesus would have been looking down at the temple from Mount Zion, and this is what he would have been looking at. This is the back door of the temple. The front door would have been on the other side, facing the west. He's looking down here, and St. John is going to use this vantage point in his gospel. Recall that in the, in the gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, Jesus has the Last Supper at the Passover meal. But when you read John's gospel, that isn't the case. John has Good Friday, the day Jesus dies as the Passover. Why? Again, as Father Walsh has told us time be many times before, the Gospel writers are trying to give us a theology, not a history. For Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they see the obvious connection of Jesus being the Passover lamb. And so, they focus then on the fact that Jesus has the Last Supper at a Passover meal where he makes the identification of himself to the Passover lamb. And then in instituting the Eucharist, he says, do this in memory of me. In other words, he's telling his followers, from now on, when you eat this meal, this special meal that we all eat all the time, don't do it simply because you remember the, the Passover meal of the Old Testament when our people were led from, from um, slavery in Egypt. Remember it now as what I'm about to do as leading you from the slavery of sin. So they make the point of it being there. John, on the other hand, sees a very other connection. You see, when Jesus looks down at the temple, he's looking at the Passover time, and the Passover lamb is slain on the Passover preparation day, as you would suspect. That would have been, on, in this particular year, on Friday. What happens is, when the sun lines up with those three gates into the Holy of Holies, the high priest slays the first of the Passover lambs, and that's the beginning of Passover then. All the other lambs were slain that day, taken home for the evening meal. Because in the Jewish way of calculating time, the next day begins at sundown, not at sunrise. John then makes the point of saying Jesus dies just at the moment that the high priest is slaying the Paschal lamb. That's his way of making the identification of Jesus with the Passover lamb. Well then, in this next slide, as Jesus then comes down, He's riding the donkey. He would have passed through the beautiful gate, or as we call it now, the golden gate. Notice that it's walled up today. That goes back to a times when many of the gates in Jerusalem have been changed over the years. The Jewish belief today is that when the Messiah comes, remember they don't recognize Jesus as the Messiah, he will burst through those gates and that will signal the end of the world. Jesus then passes through these gates, and the next slide shows what he goes into, again from the model of Jerusalem at his time. He goes into a hustle-bustle city of, of, of Jerusalem, and he's heading for the right top corner of this slide. He's heading for the temple. We don't remember exactly, or we don't know from Scripture, exactly what Jesus did between Sunday and Thursday, or the Passover meal he has with his disciples.
But we do, we can suspect that he goes to the temple area, he starts to teach, and obviously he's starting to rile up the people, the authorities are becoming concerned, they hold counsel, and they start in motion the process that is going to lead to his death. In the meantime, we know on Holy Thursday, as this next slide show, Jesus finds a room, a, a house with an upper room. This is the traditional site today in Jerusalem of that house. It has a second story to it, and in this next slide you'll see that this would, is the traditional site of the room of the Last Supper. It's an upper room, it's a pillared room, it's been reconstructed of course by, since the Crusades, this wouldn't be the original uh, room itself, very little of the, of the cities, of uh, the, the houses in Jesus' time are left, but this is a traditional site, it gives you an idea of what that room might have looked like. Now I'd like to show you something here on the board about that last meal that we often misunderstand. We all have seen that very famous picture by Leonardo da Vinci called The Last Supper. Leonardo da Vinci painted that out of his own experience of the Italian Renaissance when people sat that way. But what Jesus would have done, he would have eaten at what was called the, the kind of banquet meal of his day, which was called a triclinium. It's a Greek word which means three-sided. In other words, the real Passover meal or Passover table would have looked like this, three-sided, with an open area in here so that the servants could walk in between and place food on the table from all directions. The people then reclined at these banquet meals. And the way they would do that is couches would be arranged out from the table so that a person would lie on the table on his left arm like so and there were no utensils in those days. You would just simply reach food with your fingers. Most of the food in the Mideast even to this day is bite-sized in nature or pieces of fruit, uh, pieces of vegetable that you can simply get up. So your right hand. That explains, of course, the reason why the woman in the, in the gospel could come up behind Jesus and wash his feet at one of those other meals. His feet were away from him, not under the table as we sit today. So we know then that this is the triclinium that Jesus was sitting at. Uh, unlike ourselves, the place of honor at a triclinium was not here, the head of the table, so to speak. But the, head, the way the, um, the ancients did things, the farther around to the right you went, the more important was your place of seat, the more honorable was the seat. By that standard, of course, you would imagine that the end of this side would be where Jesus would have sat, except in those days they had to be careful, and so you never sat on the end of a table because you could be uh, approached by an assassin, there's nobody here, so the actual, the place of honor would have been right here, one in from the far right and your most trusted friend would sit to your right so that he could defend you, your sort of bodyguard, if anybody would come at you. So, this then would have been where Jesus would have been sitting. What do we know from the Gospel? We know that St. John was, must have been sitting here. Think about it for a moment. The Gospel says that John lays his head back on Jesus' breast and asks him a question. Who is it that's going to betray you? If you put yourself in that position I've suggested, you see how easy it is just simply to lay your head back and talk over your shoulder to the person who's right behind you. On the other hand, we also know who was on the other side of Jesus. Because Jesus says to John, the person I place my hand in the bowl with will be the one who betrays me. That could only have been one of two people, either John, and it obviously wasn't him, or the person right behind him. Who would that have necessarily had to been? That would have had to have been Judas. Notice the next place of honor to Jesus. It was almost like it, to the very end, Jesus was trying to get through to Judas to win him over. We know that doesn't happen. Judas gets up and leaves. We also know one other person where that person sat at the Last Supper, and that's St. Peter. We know that St. Peter must have been sitting at one of the lower ends of the table. How do we know that? Because the Gospel says to us that Peter looked across and got John's eye and sort of signal to him, ask Jesus who's going to betray him. That could only have happened if he was across from John over here. So Peter was in the lowest place. And you can almost see Peter kind of sulking. Maybe he came in late to the dinner or whatever it was. The only place left was in what was one of the lowest places. So what does Jesus do in John's Gospel? Jesus gets up and he goes around and washes the feet of the disciples. Almost as a way of saying to Peter, don't feel bad when you're in the last place. If you want to be my follower, you have to be the server of the rest. That we can get then from the triclinium. Well, Jesus then, he eats his last supper, and he goes out to pray in the Garden of Gethsemane. 
this next slide that you'll see shows a southern exposure. We're looking from the south at the uh, city of Jerusalem. Jesus would have come out of the gate sort of right in the middle of that wall there in the lower third of the picture. This next picture, in fact, shows us that wall. Again, it's called the triple hold the wall. It's walled up today because the land has shifted and it doesn't match that any longer. Jesus comes out that gate and the next slide shows us how close he is to Jerusalem when he gets to the Garden of Gethsemane. This is the Garden of Gethsemane. And you can see from these next slides the uh, beautiful olive trees, a very quiet place. Obviously a place Jesus was used to going to because he found it in the dark. Remember, there's no electricity. There's no way that he can find his way over to, that, over to Mount Zion. He's doing this in the dark. The next picture shows you again one of those very beautiful olive trees that are still there. There he has his agony. Today, the place, the traditional spot where he had the agony in the garden is shown to you in this next slide. It's inside this church, which is called the Church of All Nations. And then the next slide, you'll see the actual rock right there under the altar. There's a, a huge rock there that is the site of Jesus' sweating blood, as we're told in the Gospel. Notice the picture above the altar uh, depicts that scene for you. We know then that as he's there, from the other side of the valley, this next slide shows you that shot, is the house of Caiaphas. At, this, at that time in Jesus' life, this area that we're standing in now, looking across to the Kedron Valley, would have been within the walls of the city of Jerusalem. That sometimes astounds people to realize that the walls of the city have changed over the years. This would have been Caiaphas's house. He would have been looking across, and Jesus could have seen then, in other words, the men coming to get him. He would have seen their torches coming. One thing I think few of us ever realize that if Jesus would have wanted to, he could have escaped. Remember Mount Zion right there in the background? All he had to do was get up over Mount Zion. It was dark. It would have been easy enough to do. And five miles away from this very serene spot with all the foliage, this next slide shows you what he would have been in the middle of. The Wadi Kilt, a desert-like place. The place in which he had spent 40 days preparing for his public ministry. Look at this next slide and see how desolate this place is. There's nothing growing there. And the next slide again shows you the deep craters people could disappear into. We know that this has happened because Barabbas, for instance, and other insurrectionists in his day would have lived in caves down in there. And no one was going to go down into that desert looking for people. It was too easy to be trapped down in there. We know that Jesus chooses not to escape. Instead, he is led away from the Garden of Gethsemane back across the Kidron Valley to the house of Caiaphas. This next slide shows you some of the foundations of what is believed to be Caiaphas's house. This is the way they stand today. This next slide shows you a reconstruction of what they might have looked like in Jesus's time. Notice it was a dungeon type place that Jesus was kept. He wouldn't have been kept in a room like this. Notice the hole there in the bottom left hand corner. What that actually is, is a hole in which they would lower prisoners down into even a subterranean, just a cave that a person would be kept in. So Jesus then is taken over there and he's put into that cave. Caiaphas finds out that Herod's in town and also that Pilate's in town. They know that because it's Passover time. So Caiaphas de de decides to send Jesus over to Pilate because he knows he has to be condemned to death and the Jewish authorities do not have the power to do that. This next slide shows you again from the model of, in Jerusalem where Pilate might have been staying. This is called the Antonia Fortress. It was built by King Herod and named after his good friend Mark Anthony from the Cleopatra fame, of Cleopatra fame. Notice where it was positioned by Herod. He was no dumb man. Those columns that you see in the bottom half of the picture are actually the outer wall of the temple. So it was Herod's way of building a structure in which he could peer down from the walls right into the temple area. Why would he want to do that? Because the temple area would have been the place that insurrectionists would have tr gone to teach, would have tried to arouse the people. So Herod was very clever. By building the building the way he did and where he did, he was saying to the people, look, I'm still in control, and he could also keep an eye on what was going on down in the temple area. Jesus then is taken to this place. He's again put into a dungeon. He's scourged and he's crowned with thorns. This next slide shows you what the pl traditional place that happened is, is, uh, looks like today. 
It's called the lithostratos, or the place of the rock pavement. The only thing that would be of antiquity in this slide is the floor, those flagging stones. They themselves do not go back to the time of Jesus, but they go back to the first hundred years or so. It would have been a place that would, where troops would have gathered. This next slide shows you what it might have looked like in Jesus' time, very dark and dungeon-like. And this last slide in this particular spot shows you some graffiti that was found from the time of Jesus of a game that the soldiers used to play. They would throw dice, and depending on where in that circle or square the dice would land, they would then play the king with prisoners. You remember that that was the game they were playing with Jesus when they struck him on the head and called him king and put a purple cloak around him. So this then would have been the game that he was made the, the, um, the joke of. Jesus then comes out of the Lysistros. He is condemned to death by Pilate, and he begins the way of the cross, the traditional Via Dolorosa as we know it today. He is, first of all, He's, the cross is placed upon his shoulders. He comes out the door, and this next slide might have been the kind of a, uh, of a street that's there today. Now, I, I must point out to you today that the level of the ground in Jesus' day would have been some six feet lower than it is at present. But this is one of the likely ways he could have gone. These flagstones, some of them, not all of them, many of them have been redone, but some of them do date back to the first hundred year. So it gives you an idea of the narrow kind of way Jesus would have had to walk. Again, he comes down that same road. In this next slide, there's an extension of it. He's carrying this wooden cross beam on his shoulders. He gets to the bottom of this alleyway, and it's the traditional place of the third station where he falls. You can understand he's carrying a heavy, a heavy beam across his shoulders. He's weakened. He's beaten. He trips, and he falls at this particular point. He gets up. He turns the corner, and this next slide shows you he comes to another corner. This is a traditional site where he meets his mother. If you notice on the wall to the extreme left of the picture, right about the middle, there's a little white marker. That's a marker that's placed in the wall as a, as a place of meeting his mother. He might have passed people just like this who were looking at him, wondering what was going on. Probably he would have passed even larger crowds because remember this is Passover day. I'll show you a picture a little, little ways on of what the crowds really might have looked like. He continues up this and remember he's going up one of the hillsides now. One of those out of the Tyropean Valley. So he's not walking on two level. He's going to start an ascent. The next picture here shows you he passes some children. Here are some children, a picture that I took of kids just looking at us wondering where we were going. You can see to get a, a kind of a feel then for what he was passing along that way as he goes to his death. Crowds looking at him, wondering who he was, who is this person. The next slide then shows him as he starts up the Tyropean Valley. I don't know in, this, in his day if there would have been steps there. There might have been. But he has to start dragging this cross then up these steps. Here is where si uh, Simon of Cyrene is given the cross to help Jesus. The next slide shows you then what the crowds really might have looked like. Just jammed together as this criminal is being led through their midst. They're looking at him, wondering what's going on. It's at this site that we have the traditional place where Veronica wipes the face of Jesus along his way. He goes a little farther along in this next slide, and again, he falls. You can see why he'd be falling. He's climbing a hill. He gets back up. He goes along a little bit further, and the, eighth, the ninth station is... He meets women, the women of Jerusalem, and tells them, don't weep for me, weep for yourselves. He continues along then, and the, the next slide will show where at his day the wall would have been. That building in the background is actually a Russian Orthodox cathedral today. He would have gone outside of that wall, there would have been a gate there, and he would have been outside the city. Now remember in these next slides that what you see is the way it exists today. In Jesus' time, it, this, these structures would not have been there. There are churches, a church now of the Holy Sepulcher that is over the sites of both Calvary as well as the tomb. He goes up to Calvary then. The next slide shows that. He, it's, Calvary is right under that dome, which is right in front of us. You'll notice the black dome in back of it. It would be the, the dome which is presently over the tomb of Jesus. The next slide then shows us that black dome. Under, underneath which would be the tomb of Jesus. The next slide then shows us uh, the foundation of that that goes back to the year 325 when St. Helena built the ancient Holy Sepulchre. 
He climbs up to Calvary, or is made to climb up to Calvary in this next slide. And here's what it looks like today. Of course, it would have been just a rock in his day. And right underneath that altar is where the traditional site of his cross would have been. The next slide shows you what's underneath that altar. This is the actual rock of Calvary itself. He is crucified there, and this next slide is a grim reminder of just what crucifixion is. This is a picture actually found from the time of Christ of a bone, a foot bone, with a nail driven through it to show that crucifixion was something which was very frequent, first of all, and also something very real in his day. The next slide then shows you the modern site of where Jesus was taken down from the cross. It's right next to Golgotha, or Calvary. And from there, his body was taken to the place of the next slide, which is the place where his body was, was prepared for burial, and then placed in the tomb. Now, the tomb itself has been decorated, very highly decorated, and then this next slide shows you this is what the tomb looks like today, or at least the outside of it. It's called a centotaph. And the last slide of this series, series shows you the inside of the tomb. That ledge there would have been inside of a hillside, actually. Today it's been leveled off to make a flat, lying place. Two years ago, when I was back in Israel, I had the fortune of seeing what the actual tomb might have looked like in Jesus' time. Uh, this would be what a rolling stone tomb looked like at the time of Jesus. You can see there the rolling stone that is on the left side. And if you look closely, you'll see right in front of that opening a little trough. What would happen is some men would get behind the stone, they would roll it in front of that opening, and then as in the case of Jesus, if it was an important person, that stone would be sealed with wax so that nobody could get into that opening. The reason it wasn't always sealed with wax is that these tombs were not always made for just one person. This next slide shows you what you see if you look inside that opening of the last picture. You'll notice that there are here, you can see three of the six uh, tunnels almost that are cut into the rock. What would happen then in this last slide of this series is that a person would actually be slid with his body would be slid into that opening and there that person then would be left to lie. You can see for instance why Mary was concerned who is going to move back the rock for us. It would be a formidable task even for men to do although there is a trough and the rock and so forth we still someone was going to have to move it. Well of course that brings us to the climax of today Easter. That's what we celebrate the fact not of an empty tomb, but the fact that Jesus is risen from the dead and that because of his willingness to love us and die and rise for us, all of us have new life. Happy Easter to you and have a very good week. Your comments and suggestions concerning this program or topics for future programs would be greatly appreciated. Mail your comments to Living Words, Post Office Box 1189, Biloxi, Mississippi 39533.